Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship. If you're visiting with us, you're especially welcome. And we trust that you feel at home with us and you sense the Lord's presence as we meet together uh, to worship Him. The prayer meeting tonight is at 6 o'clock, and that's followed by the evening service at 6.30. And our uh, assistant pastor, James, will be responsible for the preaching of the Word. Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, the prayer in care groups. And if you're new to the church and you haven't uh, yet been uh, assigned uh, a group, please uh, speak to uh, one of the elders and they'll make sure that you have a, a place to go on Tuesday night. Service is next Sunday at 11 and I'll be preaching and then 6.30 when James will be preaching. Next Sunday's Connection Sunday and we're offering hospitality to our Filipino friends who have joined us and uh, if you could uh, uh, offer uh, lunch uh, to uh, a family or to two or three of the men, if you could just uh, sign up uh, at the list on the information desk so we just need uh, know how many uh, places we, we, we have. Uh, and then Thursday the 22nd, we're having a seminar on how to lead a Bible study. James will be taking that, and that's for uh, everybody involved in leading a Bible study, whether it's uh, the ladies' work, uh, the prayer and care groups, uh, the Bible class leaders, the deep leaders. If you're involved in any way in leading a Bible study, it's very important that you come uh, to that meeting. Uh, now, you might have been doing it for years and you think you have nothing to learn, but you, uh, I'm sure, will have a contribution uh, to make. So, please uh, do come along, put that date in the diary, and do uh, come along to it. Uh, we're having a baptismal service on Easter Sunday, God willing, and if you're interested in baptism and membership, please speak uh, to, to Ken uh, as soon as you can, and you'll receive then notification of the start of those uh, classes. Uh, do remember uh, uh, Margaret Mayers in your prayers. Um, Margaret had a fall yesterday, uh, broke her hip and has been taken into the Royal, probably for a partial hip replacement tomorrow. So do remember Margaret, Margaret Kirkpatrick, uh, who was baptized recently in the church, uh, has also been taken in uh, with gallbladder problems and probably will need an operation as well. And others who are unwell, like Val uh, and Eileen, John uh, Maxwell, just do remember our friends, Neil McLaren, uh, Lynn Miller, in uh, your prayers. The psalmist says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's worship the Lord. Stand.
psalm this morning is Psalm 112. Psalm 112, and we'll read from verse 1. Psalm 112, reading from verse 1. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The genera generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his darkness uh, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. A lovely psalm. Uh, I love uh, verse 4. Uh, Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. That even in the darkest of situation, uh, God uh, gives light. The righteous man is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that this uh, is your day. We thank you on this day uh, light uh, was created uh, to illuminate uh, the world. We thank you that on this day Jesus rose from the dead. We thank you that on this day uh, the Spirit came, and we thank you that on this day we gather as a company of your redeemed people to bathe in the light, to rejoice in the resurrection, and by your Spirit to offer our worship to you, the triune God. We bless you and praise you. We have so much to praise you for. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for bringing us into your family. We thank you for the eternal hope that we have. We thank you for the future that awaits us. We thank you that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of your own Son. And we just want, as a company of your people, to return and to express our thanks to you in the worship that we render for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us, that even in the darkest of situations that we experience and encounter in life, that even then a light dawns for the upright. We bless you and praise you that our hearts are fortified and steady through our faith in you. We thank you that even though we are assaulted by the wiles of the devil, nevertheless, Nothing can sever, uh, sever or separate us from your love. And we praise you and we thank you for all that you have uh, done for us. And we pray, O oh God, this day, today, that you would help us to rejoice in you, the God of our salvation. We uh, do remember those who are unwell, and we very lovingly bring them before you. We remember the two Margarets in hospital. And we pray that you would draw close and that you would sustain and that you would comfort and that you would steady their hearts. We think of John uh, at home, uh, just out of hospital. We pray that you would heal him quickly and restore him to health and strength. We very lovingly bring Val and Eileen to you, uh, English, and we just pray, O oh God, that you would be uh, with them for Neil and for Lynn and for others within our fellowship who are suffering. We pray, O oh God, that you the God of all comfort would draw close to them and give them grace to help them in their time of need. As we come to worship you, O God, we come very conscious of our own failings and shortcomings. 
We know, O oh God, that we have sinned against You, and we continue to sin against You in thought, in, in the things that we say, and in the actions that we do. And we pray, O oh God, that You would forgive us and cleanse us, that as we come to worship You today, we might do so with clean hands and pure hearts. And we pray, O oh God, that You would lift our hearts to heaven through the songs that we sing, through the prayers that we offer, through the preaching of Your Word, and through our meditation around Your table. We pray, O oh God, that, that all of these things, these means of grace that You have given to us, would draw our hearts and our affections out towards You, the living God. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Now, we're going to worship the Lord uh, in our tithes and offerings. going to continue in praise. Uh, the psalm we just read said, the righteous shall never be moved. Uh, and the reason for that is because our king uh, will, will reign forever. His throne will ever remain. So we're going to sing our, our next couple of songs uh, to help us focus on that. Um, this world will pass and its glories will fade, but one name forever shall be praised. Let's stand uh, as Lindsay leads us off. Let's stand.
Heavenly Father, you are the ancient of days. And we thank you that your throne will remain forever. Lord, how blessed we are that we will reign there with you. And we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished on the cross and for his resurrection so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be there with you. Lord, thank you so much. And as we come now before your word, Lord, we pray for your servant, Stephen. Lord, we ask that you would empower him, that you would um, use him this morning, and that you would watch over your word to perform it in our hearts, that you would transform each one of us. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks to James and uh, the group for leading us in our worship. So much uh, appreciated. Would you turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's going to be a good sermon this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 9 to the end of the the chapter, but uh, let's just read from verse 1 to see that in its context. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant, ought you not rather to mourn that him who has done this be removed from among you? For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside, purge the evil person from among you. Amen. And we know God will always bless the reading of His Word. Now, if you were, have been visiting the church today, or perhaps for the first time last week and today, you might, you might be forgiven for thinking that the pastor of this church is obsessed with the issue of discipline, church discipline. And I just want to point out that we're working through 1 Corinthians and uh, this is the portion that we have come to that we're dealing with this morning. I hope we're balanced on this issue and we're not um, obsessed with it. So, um, you, you'll remember then from our study last week that Paul had raised this thorny subject of church discipline with the Corinthians. It seems that a member of the church had been having an immoral relationship with his stepmother, and in the name of love or perhaps in the name of of liberty, the Corinthian church had refused to do anything about it. They tolerated this grievous sin within the fellowship, but not only did they tolerate it, they were actually proud uh, about it. Paul says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. A sin so grievous that it scandalized the churches, uh, the other churches, and was frowned upon even within pagan society was a source of of boasting in the Corinthian church. Well, Paul will have none of it. And he tells the church in verse 5 to call a church meeting and formally hand this man over to Satan, in other words, to put him outside the church. 
Now, from verse 9 on, Paul deals with the whole issue of discipline in a much more general sense, although uh, he does refer back to the case of this uh, immoral brother that was in membership of the church. And the first thing I want you to notice from our studies this morning uh, is the, the subjects of church discipline. Look at verse 9 and 10. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Paul, it seems, had already written a letter to the Corinthians, what commentators call the lost letter or the previous letter, a letter that is not part of the canon of Scripture. And in that letter, he warned them not to associate with sexually immoral people. Now, the Corinthians had interpreted that statement in completely the wrong way. They thought that Paul was telling them to separate from the immoral people around them. This word uh, associate or keep company, as the authorized version has it, has to do with social intimacy and social interaction. And the Corinthians had interpreted, interpreted that in such a way that they had isolated themselves from the world. Corinth was a very frightening and intimidating place for Christians with this proliferation of pagan shrines and the rampant promiscuity that was associated with those shrines. And so the Corinthians interpreted Paul's statement in his last letter to mean that they had to separate themselves, they had to isolate themselves from the world in a kind of a monastic, pietistic kind of way. Now, Paul says, I didn't mean that at all. Not meaning at all, he says in verse 10, the sexually immoral of the world. He says if that was to happen, uh, you would have to enter some ecclesiastical super shuttle, be taken to an extraterrestrial monastic mastership, and there live. No, he says, I was speaking about the church, verse 11. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. It's the people who are immoral, who are in membership of the church, that you are to have no social intimacy or fellowship with. You see, there's always been a tendency in the professing church of Jesus Christ to withdraw and to isolate from the world. In the third and, third and fourth centuries, monastic orders sprang up and flourished where people tried to withdraw from the world and the evil influences of the world. Some took to living alone in isolated islands or in caves as hermits, and others retreated into monastic uh, orders cut off from the outside world. There was a group in the fourth and fifth century who were known as the Pillar Saints, and they followed a man known as Simeon, and they began to live on top, or he began to live on top of a six-foot pillar, but he kept extending it and extending it until he lived on top of a pillar 60 foot high. And listen, he lived there for 47 years. Can you imagine it? 47 years. Not only uh, is that a contradiction of the teaching of Jesus when He says, Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But it's also a contradiction of the incarnational ministry uh, or mission of Jesus when He came into the, the world to save sinners and mix freely with tax collectors and sinners. Paul says, You have misunderstood me when I said not to associate with sexually immoral people. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. It's there you must separate yourself from immoral people, like this immoral brother who was having this incestuous relationship with his stepmother. Now, of course, we don't have monastic orders with an evangelicalism, but we do have monastic mindsets. Some professing Christians who are horrified by the immorality and depravity of the world, retire into uh, an invisible spiritual uh, monastic order. 
They don't want anything to do with the world. They have no contact with the world. They separate themselves off from the world. And the end result of that is that their light that is to shine before men shines only in that little narrow group of Christian friends that they have. Many Christians make monasteries out of churches, and although they don't live in them, the people that they associate with are the people that go to that church. And the sad thing is they justify that as a biblical position. Paul says the only way you're going to leave this world, to go out of this world, to have that kind of separation, is to die. Let me give you an illustration of that. A friend of mine who's a pastor, got into awful trouble with his church because he managed an amateur football club on a Saturday. And uh, because the uh, team was predominantly Catholic and afterwards, uh, and they were sponsored by uh, a licensed restaurant, the church deemed this to be worldly. E even though three of the boys uh, came to church and were converted, and the restaurant owner himself was brought to faith in Christ. But the church accused him of being worldly. Now, I think they would have accused Jesus of being worldly. In fact, they did accuse Jesus of being worldly because he mixed with publicans and sinners. The monastic orders are still alive and kicking within evangelical churches. I remember a, a man in uh, Bethany, I had said to the church, now, I want you to invite a special event. I want you to invite all your non-Christian friends to this event. And he came to me and he said, Stephen, I don't have any non-Christian friends. I don't have any non-Christian friends. Because he had isolated himself from everybody who wasn't a, a, a Christian. And Paul is very clear on this. He says, you have misunderstood me. Of course you are to associate, verse 10, with sexually immoral people, with swindlers and idolaters. How else are you going to win them? Now, that's not to say we participate or give approval to their practices, but it does also doesn't mean to say that we withdraw from them completely. Jesus put it like this in John 17, in the world, but not off the world. He prayed to the Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So then Paul corrects this misunderstanding and says, when I wrote to you not to associate with uh, sexually immoral people, I didn't mean immoral people in the world, but rather immoral people in the church like this offender. People who claim to be Christians, um, but they deny their Christian profession by the way that they live. It's the old picture of the boat. To think of the church as a boat and the sea as the world, it's crucial that the boat is in the sea, but it's disastrous when the sea is in the boat. I, uh, when we were growing up, we had a boat, and every winter we would pull the, the boat up from its anchorage, and we would place it on a trailer. And one day I arrived down at the boat, and there's my sister with a fishing rod over the edge of the boat at the edge of the water. No water. She was fishing amongst the stones. Well, how are you going to fish for men if you're not in the sea? I think that's a very important principle. Secondly, notice the ground for church discipline. As I said in our last study, one of the great problems with church discipline is knowing what sins should actually be disciplined. I met a man recently at a conference, and uh, he was excommunicated from his church for disagreeing with the elders. <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? But, but anyway, he was excommunicated from his church from disagreeing with the elders. Um, I met another woman I knew quite well, and uh, she was excommunicated for, from her church for wearing trousers, not on a Sunday, but on a Saturday. I'm not sure, quite sure what they would do with the believing women in China, but that's beside the point. And uh, John Murray, Professor John Murray, 
was excommunicated from his church in Scotland because he wrote a little pamphlet that said it was all right to take the tram to church on a Sunday. Well, Paul lists some of the sins that uh, are the subject or matters for discipline, and it's not an exhaustive list, but it certainly gives us the kind of things that he has in mind. Look at verse 11, but now I'm writing to you. It's interesting, I think, that two things, that all these sins actually are um, connected in some way to paganism and the pagan culture of Corinth and the pagan rites of Corinth. And also, they are not one-off sins, but they are uh, continual sins because the person is, is known as uh, an idolater, a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler. So, it's not just that they've slipped once into this kind of, of sin. This is a pattern of behavior that they're living by. But let's look at verse 11. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. Here Paul lists six offenses that he deems worthy of church discipline. Now, they're quite comprehensive, covering sex, possessions, religion, the use of the tongue, drink, and, and money. The first one he lists is sexual immorality. Uh, the world in which we live has taken a good gift of God and has corrupted it and perverted it. It's not the use of the gift here that is being uh, condemned, but it's the abuse of the gift. The Greek word pernina from which we get our English word pornography, covers a multitude of sexual misdemeanors. All are unacceptable in the Christian church when the Bible says the marriage bed ought not to be defiled. Those sins call for discipline. Secondly, he talks about uh, the greedy or covetousness. Now, we might be surprised that right in the middle of immorality and swindling, we find this word uh, um, um, right, right in the middle of, of immorality and idolatry, we find uh, this person guilty of greed. But remember, it's the pagan culture, and it's people that are prostituting themselves to these shrines in order to gain financial um, uh, uh, influence and to gain for themselves uh, a, a fortune that they're sacrificing their faith in order to uh, progress um, financially. So, Karl Marx, one of the things that he objected to in religion and why he rejected uh, religion was that his father, who was a Jew, moved to a new part of Germany and converted to Lutheranism because he reckoned that Lutheranism would give him greater financial rewards, uh, giving him greater uh, financial contacts with the, the community. It's that kind of thing that's being condemned. Uh, an, ex, uh, 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 an idolater, uh, those given over to false gods that are, are worshiping the plethora of false gods that were in Corinth, the, re, the reviler. One commentator translates that as an abusive man. It has to do with the tongue, where you're verbally abusive. Uh, uh, drunkenness, the drunkard. Paul is not speaking of consuming alcohol, but being consumed by alcohol, getting drunk, intoxicated with alcohol. And in days when so many Christians are, are swinging away from uh, the teetotalism of a previous generation, it's vital that the church needs to understand how sinful drunkenness actually is that it can give rise to much of the other sins that are actually being listed here by Paul. I heard of a young Christian uh, recently at university who um, uh, decided that he would accompany his friends to the, the clubs and to the pubs uh, in order to uh, witness uh, to them. But uh, he got so intoxicated that he had to be carried home by his friends, and it was his non-Christian friends that were disgusted by his behavior. Drunkenness is a sin that uh, calls for church discipline. And then we have the 
swindler or the extortioner, and that word means to steal with force. Some uh, translations render it as robber or carrying off with violence. So, here's a list of sins that uh, Paul deems worthy of church discipline. The immoral, the greedy, the idolater, the slanderer, the drunkard, and the swindler. Now, notice all of these sins are serious, scandalous sins. These are sins that bring the testimony of the gospel into disrepute. And the church must take action because of the testimony of the church. A church that tolerates sin will lose its testimony. Now, Paul in other places lists other sins like blasphemy, like divisiveness, um, like heresy. But all these sins are grievous sins. They're public sins. And what I think we need to grasp is that they're unrepented sins. This man that we're we're talking about last week had his father's wife. This was an ongoing relationship that he had. It wasn't something that just happened. He was um, persevering or persisting in it. Those are the grounds for discipline. Scandalous, public, and grievous sins. And the action then that's taken, notice what Paul says at the end of verse 13, purge the evil person from among you. Purge the evil person from among you. That line is really taken out from the book of Deuteronomy when um, Moses lists various offenses, and he says to the people of Israel, you must purge this evil from among you. Now, the way we do that in the new covenant is excommunication. It's to remove them from membership of the church, where you put the offending brother or sister outside the membership of the church. Remember, Paul in verse 5 calls the Corinthians to hand this man over to Satan. And then in verse 2, he says to put him out of the fellowship, be removed from among you. If a man or woman is not living up to their profession, Uh, or deny that profession by the way that they live, they ought to be removed from the membership of the church. The church is a society of professing Christians, and if they no longer profess or deny uh, that profession in the way that they live, they should be removed from the church. Uh, And it's painful. It's difficult. I was talking to a pastor during the week, and I was telling him what I was preaching on, and he says, have you ever done it? Have you ever done it? So, this kind of discipline is, is rare. It's rare. I think in my ministry, I've only done it twice, um, brought the recommendation to the church that people would be removed from membership, but, but it, is, it is rare. And uh, I think we need to be um, at least taking the Word of God seriously when it comes to, remember, public sin, scandalous sin, and unrepented sin. Now, that brings us then uh, to our last point, um, and I want you to notice the response to church discipline. So, what are we, we looking for in church discipline? And the answer, very simply, is repentance. Church discipline is not a punishment. When I was out in Peru, um, I was on a panel, and I was asked these questions about church discipline. And the Peruvians were saying, well, how long do you think that a person should serve for adultery? <laughs> they were looking for a sentence like, oh, 18 months for adultery. Premarital sex, how, how long uh, a sentence should you apply? Stealing, how long a sentence? But that's not the issue. The issue is, is, is not how long they serve outside the church. It's that you look for repentance. So, I was at a church um, a couple of weeks ago, and a girl came up to me who was on our, one of our youth teams in Balamuni in the early days. And as a young woman, she got pregnant and uh, um, got carried away one night. The girl became, she became pregnant, 
and she went uh, and told the church, and the church banned her from the Lord's table for nine months. You mustn't come to the table for nine months. They never asked her, was she sorry? They never asked her, was she repentant? They just imposed the sentence, nine months, you mustn't come to the table. After nine months, after she had the baby, uh, they went to her and said, you can now come back to the table. And they never asked her, was she repentant or was she sorry? You see, the, the issue is repentance. It's not a punishment, it's repentance. Now, I want you to turn just to Matthew chapter 18 for, for a moment. Matthew 18, uh, this well-known passage, um, Matthew 18 and verse 15, where our Lord mentions the church. Our Lord only mentioned the church in two places, uh, Matthew 16, when He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and Matthew 18, when He speaks about church discipline. I think that's significant, church discipline. So, Matthew um, 18 and verse 15, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So, you, you go. Don't go and tell the pastor. Don't go and tell the elders. You go. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. So, at that point, if he, if he repents, you forgive him. It's done and dusted. It's over. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. Every charge must may be so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, well, if he does listen, what do you do? If he repents, you forgive him, and you carry on, done and dusted. That's it over. But if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, he doesn't tell the church at that point to take action. He says, tell it to the church. So, the church is informed, and the church pursues him, and the church calls him to repentance. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So, at every stage, the opportunity is given for repentance. It's not a sentence to be served. It's a call to repentance. And then in verse 21, remember, Peter, overwhelmed by this, says, comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Now, the rabbi is taught three times. So, Peter shouldn't high. He's seven, saying seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Do you, do you see what he's saying? What our Lord is teaching, that the goal in discipline is always repentance, and as soon as repentance become evidence, uh, becomes evident, forgiveness must be extended. Aye. So, imagine that then that he doesn't repent and he's put outside the church. What should your attitude be to him? So, you remove him from church. What should your attitude be to him? Well, Jesus says, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, how did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? Well, He mixed with them. He socialized with them. And He preached the gospel to them. He used it as an opportunity for evangelism. Now, it does say in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, don't even eat with such a person or, 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 you know, avoid such a person. But I think he's talking about people inside the church at that point. Once these people are put outside the church, you treat them as unbelievers, which means you bring the gospel to them and you try to persuade them of the truth of the gospel and their necessity of repentance. So, this whole, whole idea of shunning, you know, that has been popularized by the Jehovah's Witnesses, that you, you won't even speak or eat with members of your own family, I think is as far uh, from the teaching of Christ 
as heaven is from hell. It's inside the church. So, so Paul and Titus says, warn a divisive person once, warn them twice, then have nothing to do with them. Now, he's talking about extending fellowship to them at that point. So, so look how um, uh, 1 Corinthians 5 ends. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? So, when they're outsiders, you go back to the beginning of verse 9 when he says, I didn't mean that you don't uh, associate with, with people of the world. I'm talking about people inside the church. Once they're outside the church, you socialize with them, you interact with them, you dine with them, you offer hospitality to them in order to win them back. It, uh, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Do you see what he's saying? When, when they're inside the church, he says, um, you don't associate with immoral people. You let them feel the breeze, the coldness, the frostiness of being outside of Christ. Yes, you're nice to them. You're pleasant with them. You don't ignore them, but you don't talk about the deep things of God with them. But they realize that there is a change, that they have broken fellowship with the Lord and they have broken fellowship with the church. If they're unrepentant, you put them outside the church, and then Jesus says, you treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. In other words, you see them the object of evangelistic endeavor, and you do all that you can to bring them back and persuade them of the truth of the gospel. And this, this is a difficult subject, and I think it has been twisted, and it has been used and abused to, to intimidate people and to uh, put people outside churches who disagree with the leadership of the church. Uh, that's an abuse of power. What we're looking for always is repent. And as soon as the, the person repents, then the forgiveness is extended. Do you remember uh, David? And um, for 18 months, he's groveling under that, the weight of this, his sin with Bathsheba and uh, thinking, probably resigned himself to the fact that he's never going to have the intimacy that he once enjoyed with the Lord when he wrote all those uh, glorious and beautiful psalms. I'm never going to experience that again. Um, I'm just going to live in a state of barrenness. And then Nathan comes, and he tells them that little parable about a man stealing a man's uh, sheep. And uh, David uh, explodes and bursts into a rage, a rage and condemns that man worthy of death. Now, death was there for adultery, but it wasn't there for stealing a man's sheep. It was a, completely, a complete overreaction. And then Nathan, with all the authority of heaven, says, Thou art the man. And David says, I have sinned. And the, Im immediately those words are on his lips. Nathan comes and says, the Lord has taken away your sin. Immediately, repentance was forthcoming. Forgiveness was extended. And we must never as a church fall into the trap of, of bearing grudges of, of, of distancing ourselves from people who once walked well with God and have fallen into sin. The moment, the moment repentance is forthcoming, forgiveness is to be extended. May God help us to follow His Word. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for its teaching. We thank You for uh, the fact that it does prick our conscience, and we pray, O oh God, that You would help us to get this balance with connection with the world, association with the world, so that we can be salt to savor the world, and light to shine in the world, and yet uh, to be distinct and different from the world as well. We pray for wisdom. We pray, O oh God, that when it comes to this whole thorny issue of church discipline, that You would help us to be biblical 
to be loving, to be forgiving, 70 times 7, 77 times, that we'll not bear grudges and have resentment, but we'll have arms open, just like the father in the prodigal son, that we might have our arms open to welcome back repentant sinners. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stop.